In this review of the week's news, North Canterbury flooded, Pegasus School opened and students had a wacky race. This is CTV News Week in Review, I'm Grant Mangan. Christchurch City narrowly missed being flooded this week, but not North Canterbury. Businesses, schools and roads were all shut on Tuesday as the area coped with the rising floodwaters. It was an early wake-up call for residents at Wiltshire Court. At 6am, 21 elderly residents were evacuated to a welfare centre at Rangiora Baptist Church after contaminated water started seeping inside their home. With the assistance of police, fire and ambulance, we basically evacuated these residents to the local um, Baptist church um, to just to remove them from the actual contamination. As the day unfolded and the rain continued to pour, the Waimakadere District Council were confident no other areas needed evacuating. We've got the situation where our soils are absolutely saturated after the March and April storms and, and of course when we get a, a really bad storm like this one, the water all the water automatically starts running across the top. It's uh, not even getting soaked in at all. That doesn't mean the area still wasn't slammed by the bad weather. State Highway 1 was causing trouble for motorists. North of Saltwater Creek was closed. This viewer captured traffic lined up bumper to bumper as four-wheel drives were the only vehicles allowed to make it through the deep water. Well, I was heading to Rotherham to teach dancing and uh, it was bumper to bumper um, from... Uh, Waikuku through to Amberley and I couldn't even get to the Ashworth passing lane and I had to turn around. Following on from the March floods, areas to the east of North Canterbury became engulfed in water. Rangira High School shut their gates to students and local businesses were forced to close as their properties were trapped behind lakes of water. But we certainly um, have got um, houses that are under threat. Um, we have set up a welfare centre at the Rangira Baptist Church and uh, we will also um, we continue to monitor um, where individual houses are under threat. It's, uh, it tends to be almost a property by property thing, but there's also particular areas which of our towns which are, have been affected. Steve Graham's been on call with St John, dealing with flood-related issues from today's storm. Minor motor vehicle accidents, um, minor respiratory patients, uh, which you get in cold weather, um, and just pretty much workload is pretty much steady within the Canterbury region due to this weather. This isn't the first time the Waimakadere district has flooded. Back in 2008, the entire place was underwater. David Ayres says the council will be looking at solutions to prevent significant flooding happening in the future. Emma Cropper, CTV News. The Christchurch City Council has found a short-term solution to the city's flooding issues. Temporary pumps have been deployed to help ease rising floodwaters. It could be the end of scenes like this for the Flockton Basin. With a bit of Kiwi ingenuity and the use of a local resident's backyard, this pumping system has been put in place to save Flockton streets from drowning underwater. These pumps pick that water that's draining into it from Flockton Basin and shoot it over that, um, over that shutter. The trap door shuts off the underground pipe leading into Dudley Creek. And by doing that, we drain or we preserve this capacity in this pipe purely for, for Flockton Basin. And that'll give Flockton Basin <coughs> a chance to drain in the earlier parts of the storm while there's still capacity in the downstream network. The Christchurch City Council has spent four and a half million dollars installing 15 of these temporary pumps around the worst affected areas in Christchurch with the hopes of saving 129 homes from severe flooding. So yeah, this is a system we can deploy really quickly in advance of a storm. They have the ability to pump half a cubic metre a second, but this prevention method is only for the smaller storms. How it works in a once in a century event like the March floods is uncertain. It, it's a long shot because it would easily, it could quite quickly be overwhelmed in a, in, a, in a big event. The mural task force was set up in March to provide relief for flood affected areas, including long and short term solutions. We actually had the, the modelling for this done uh, prior to the March storm and ready in concept, but it took that, that task force and getting a dedicated team to. Uh, take, look, this is what we think we should be doing. They just picked it up, ran with it and said, OK, this is how we do it. And so that was, you know, that was a fantastic, one of the really cool things about the task force. Only time will tell if installing these pumps was worthwhile. Emma Cropper, CTV News. Lawyers will be the only winners. That's a warning from the Insurance Council of New Zealand after the Labour Party announced a policy to set up an earthquake court 
in Christchurch. Labor leader David Cunliffe is promising to shake up the insurance sector in Christchurch if a Labor government is elected to power. The party's already proposed Kiwi Assure, a state-owned insurance company. Now Labor's proposing to set up an earthquake court to speed up the claims process for Cantabrians still waiting for a resolution. We're ramping up capacity so people who've got outstanding claims can get them heard pronto. The earthquake court would deal with claims of up to $1 million, promising to cut through a backlog of cases clogging up the system. This is a huge step forward. Um, this has been a real blockage for people and because there hasn't been an adequate court process, people haven't been able to enforce their rights on the insurance industry. This changes the game. However, the Insurance Council of New Zealand doesn't think this announcement was the game changer that it was hyped up to be. Well, we think it's misguided. Uh, we don't think it's necessary. Um, we think the only people that will really benefit from this will be the uh, legal fraternity. That's not what David Cunliffe told me this morning. David Parker has been working closely with the industry. I think they get the message that this is the easy way, please make this work. Essentially this is creating a situation where effectively uh, insurers will be forced by the state to pay people to sue, uh, which is uh, just a, uh, a notion that we uh, totally reject. Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Minister Jerry Brownlee has also chimed in. The Minister doesn't support Labor's plan to drive insurance claims into court as he says it will cost the taxpayer tens of millions of dollars. He says both the High and District Courts in Christchurch have set up special procedures to fast track earthquake related court cases. There are 270 cases currently seeking court action, most settle before going to trial, but in the High Court a case can take 12 months or more. The Insurance Council is disputing the number of insurance claims that haven't been settled. Labor says there are 10,000, but according to Tim Grafton, this isn't the case. Well, this is where the, the Labor's figures are completely wrong. Uh, like, as our statement shows, um, that we have 22,500 uh, major repairs and rebuilds. That's over that $100,000 cap. Uh, and of those, 87% are now uh, either settled or resolved. All costs of the court would be covered by the Crown. The fees would then be recouped from the insurance companies and EQC. It won't cost the public a cent, it will cost the insurance company in proportion to the number of claims that have been too slow to resolve. So the message to the insurance companies are, uh, the quicker you move this stuff, the less often you have to go to court, the less this will cost you. Court action can be very expensive and both the Labour Party and the Insurance Council aren't prepared to estimate how much it could cost. The Insurance Council says there are already free services available to people to help resolve matters, including the residential advisory and advocacy services. Labor also announced their Christchurch flooding policy today. If elected to government, Labor would start urgent work on quake-affected flood-vulnerable homes. Army engineers would be utilised to help with the protection work, and EQC would pay for earthquake damage to the land. The party is planning to launch a new Christchurch policy each week during the next month. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. Prime Minister John Key announced another step forward for the Performing Arts Precinct, with a $12.5 million music centre about to start construction. Construction on this $12.5 million music centre will start by the end of the year, the first within the Performing Arts Precinct to be built. This is a very important step forward for a city known for its love of arts and culture, and it's another positive step that the rebuild is on track. This is a significant milestone for music and arts in Christchurch. The music centre will be built north of the Isaac Theatre Royal, housing the first purpose-built concert hall in Christchurch, seating 350 people, along with facilities for rehearsing, recording, teaching and examining. As a facilities provider to the arts community, we look forward to once again providing a platform for the promotion of, of both music, opportunity and excellence. The Performing Arts Precinct hit a wall in April when the Crown stopped purchasing land for it in the city centre. And Earthquake Recovery Minister Jerry Brownlee said the entire project may have to be rethought. But today's announcement has left the Christchurch Mayor Leanne Dalzell applauding their decision to continue to go ahead. My heart sank when I learned of the government's intention to put the land purchase for this precinct on hold. Um, but my sinking heart has been well and truly uplifted um, as a result of the announcement today. 
The Christchurch City Council says they're committed to seeing the arts move back into the city centre. They're investing $30 million as part of the cost-sharing agreement with the Crown, as well as providing car parking in the area. We lost so much of the cultural fabric of our city in the earthquake, and this announcement sees that not only res restored, but also reinvigorated with the different venues coming together in the one place. The Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority believes it's only a matter of time before the Christchurch Symphony Orchestra and the Court Theatre have signed on to be part of the precinct. They'll all be connected by these public open spaces, which also double as performing arts areas. The overall results of these developments will be the creation of a city core that is easily accessible but also visually stimulating. The Performing Arts Precinct is one of 17 anchor projects planned under the Christchurch Central Development Unit's blueprint. The uh, uh, opportunity so to bring others in here and to create something quite unique in, in New Zealand, in fact, uh, is I think the most exciting part. Construction on the Music Centre is due to kick off by the end of the year. Emma Cropper, CTV News. Coming up, new buildings were opened for families and students. The Prime Minister officially opened Pegasus Bay School this week and confirmed that Phillipstown School would close. Songs and smiles in Pegasus Town today as the first school to be built after the Canterbury earthquakes opens. <laughs> Elsewhere in Christchurch, the City Council voted unanimously to back Phillipstown School, asking the government for a two-year reprieve on its closure. Hours later, the Prime Minister ruled this out. It's already been through one round of consultation, then legal action, then another round of consultation, so are there any chances the Ministry would ever back down on this now? None. Last year, Phillipstown School won a court battle with the Ministry of Education over its merger with Wollstone School. Phillipstown won nearly $100,000 in court costs from this battle. However, this didn't stop the Education Minister announcing in April the merger would go ahead. Phillipstown Principal Tony Simpson is disappointed that despite the City Council's support, the Prime Minister isn't rethinking the decision. Basically, Marcus, um, this community has spoken repeatedly and um, this proposal has never been accepted. It's always been rejected, um, widespread, and, yeah, very disappointed. The Prime Minister says the Phillipstown community should look to Pegasus Bay for inspiration. He says the new school showcases the potential for the Christchurch schools later to merge or rebuild. And I think in the end if they really objectively walk around here and have a look, they'll probably realise that actually a new school will serve their children and the children of that area better. Let me be the judge of that. Love to visit Pegasus with him. So what makes this school better than any other? The Prime Minister, Education Minister and Media were given a tour of the new classrooms this afternoon to see exactly what a modern learning environment is. The classrooms are bright, open and wide. At this school, students get to choose their own learning styles. There are no doors, students and teachers all work together. We get to see so much more of our peers as in teaching peers and we get to share everything which is nice. So some of us have strengths in different areas. I love doing art, Ali's fantastic at music, um, Claire's brilliant at English and so we can collaborate all of those so they kind of get the super teacher. It's more flash um, and yeah, a lot easier to work in. This is a window into the future so um, all of the academic research shows you that these modern open learning environments, the typically bigger classrooms but with shared teachers um, they are the way of the future. Waikuku's school role was far too large for the size of its buildings, so this year the school closed its doors and the children moved to Pegasus. It was built for 125 kids, we ended up having 260 there before we moved and now we've, we've come into here and the kids can sort of spread out and breathe and uh, it's, it's great. The new school is off the grid, it's run entirely by solar energy. The students use iPads as part of their learning and it even has its own radio station. The government wants to build 21 of these schools in Christchurch and in one decade many of the country's 2,500 schools could look more like this. But as we continue to build new schools, typically you're seeing those schools built in a more uh, open environment which is conducive to the type of learning that young New Zealanders are experiencing. Every Thursday the school will open its doors to showcase a modern learning environment for students, teachers and parents around the region. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News.
The Cantabrian is a house specifically designed for construction on uneven land. Created by insurer Southern Response, the show home opened its doors this week. From skylight to sandpit, the show home looks to be the perfect house. Built by Southern Response with Air International, the Cantabrian is a design concept for Christchurch housing, built to specifications suitable for challenging land. The original idea came from the Queenslander, a home built for the hot and humid conditions of Queensland. Southern Response Chief Executive Peter Rose says it was about building a house suitable for the Canterbury living conditions. We, we were well aware of the Queenslander in Queensland which has been built for specific conditions in Queensland and we figured the, the, the Canterbury deserved one too. We're a Canterbury based insurer, we want to leave a legacy in Canterbury and we thought houses of this nature were, were ideal. The architecturally designed home is a multi-bedroom spacious house on 100 square metres in St Albans. There's one major bedroom and then there's two others which, can, which are divided by a wardrobe. So you take the wardrobe down, you can have two, two bedrooms or, or three. Southern Response Special Projects Officer Chris Ashton says the use of light and open plan is what makes it feel like a real home. Chris Ashton, who worked on the project from the ground up, says the team are excited and wrapped with the final result. I'm very, very excited about it. I'm absolutely chuffed with the final result and if we can get uh, some people coming through here and, and making some decisions because of this, then that's, that's what it's all about and that will be very heartwarming indeed. Southern Response's Eric Bird says it's not about numbers on the Richter scale or making earthquake-proof homes. It's about building more resilient houses. The key things is the type of foundations that we've built. Um, so these are TC3 specific foundations. Um, this particular foundation is one that we've developed with our structural engineers um, and is the first one of its type. The land was sourced from Housing New Zealand and a house built for only $300,000. A modern take on the New Zealand bungalow. The design was that of Nelson based architect Richard Sellers. Chief Executive Peter Rose says Southern Response hoped to inspire potential homeowners to implement some of the specially made features into their own homes. When the guidelines came out, people said to us, we don't understand what it means. What does lightweight cladding mean? What's it look like? Is it, is it attractive or not? What does uh, regular shape mean? And so come and have a look at it and they'll see exactly what it is and hopefully be encouraged to do something like along these lines themselves. Southern Response is a government-owned insurance company settling claims for AMI policyholders with earthquake damage prior to April 2012. The Christchurch-based company have suffered a lot of criticism from disgruntled residents and protest groups. CTV News asked the chief executive how he's found it. Testing, yes, trying, uh, very challenging, but uh, but enjoyable at the same time. I mean, yes, we've had protesters, we've, we've had to modify some of our procedures, uh, but our principal objective is to get on with it and finish, so we basically put all that behind us. Moving forward with a solution for safer, smarter, and more secure housing. The concept home is open to the public Monday to Saturday, 12 till 2, and is found at 81 Cranford Street in St Albans. Joao Batista, CTV News. Still to come, bridges got built while swimming pools got demolished. A major milestone was marked on the construction of the new Ferrymead Bridge this week. A vital link to the Christchurch eastern suburbs is one step closer to being complete. This is the first of 26 beams being laid on Ferrymead Bridge, a major milestone for its construction, as these 45-tonne beams are the largest component of the replacement bridge. By the time they swing all the, the, the beams into place and have the bridge covered, we're, we're certainly looking at having that part of things completed by, by Christmas time anyway, and maybe earlier. The beams will support the new road deck, as well as housing critical services such as communication cables and water supplies. The replacement bridge is costing over $34 million to construct over a two and a half year period. But it hasn't been smooth sailing. The bridge faced delays after geotechnical investigations revealed underlying rock, meaning the piles had to be drilled eight metres into the rock. 
One lane temporary bridges border the site for commuters, but while these trucks are carting the beams onto site, the Christchurch City Council is warning there may be delays to commuters. Well, I guess there are traffic management plans in place and as I indicated, until we actually get the approaches all into place too and sealed, um, yep, I guess people are, will continue, need to continue to be patient. Um, it, it's, it's a, a long, long, it's been a long awaited project this. Phil Clearwater, chairman of the council's environmental committee, believes it's something locals are becoming used to. I think it's something that Christchurch people have become accustomed to dealing with and dealing deal with very well. And I think people need to be complimented on that. It's, um, it's long-term stuff, this, and I guess Christchurch people are accustomed now to being in queues, and um, that's how it is, but we are making progress. Once the bridge is completed, it'll make commuting for the 30,000 travellers it carries an easier task. Emma Cropper, CTV News. The fight has come to an end for a local group battling to save Centennial Pool. Next week, the diggers are moving in on site. It's been a long-fought battle for those hoping to save Centennial Pool, but the demolition of the complex will start next week. The Christchurch Central Development Units purchased the pool from the Christchurch City Council as part of their blueprint. Mayor Leanne Dalzow says her hands were tied to save the pool because the council were bound by the cost-sharing agreement signed by the previous council. The same Centennial Pool Group believes the selling of the pool to the Crown was illegal. The group sought legal advice against the demolition of the pool, which suggested the council should have consulted the public. The group then made every effort to save the pool, including this Facebook page to raise awareness. We've tried to keep it in the public profile because we how important we think this facility is and how the decisions that our elected members were making and that the government were making, we didn't think that they were right for the community. Save the Centennial spokesperson Simone Pearson has been fronting the fight over the past two years. The driver for me all along has been because I knew how important that was in the community and how valued it was and how it re really could positively impact people's quality of life. She's tried bringing as much attention to their plea to save the Centennial, even making a deputation before the council in a bikini last year. I rocked up there in my bikini, people were pretty surprised, but it had the desired effect, which is that it got some spotlight on the issue and it made the issue stand out in people's minds and that was the, that was the thinking behind um, the bikini. The site will become home to the Margaret Mayhe family playground costing $20 million to construct, a much larger price tag than the $2 million needed to repair the pool. Emma Cropper, CTV News. University of Canterbury students battled it out at the annual Wacky Races. Lunchboxes and fire engines competed to be crowned the winner. Last minute adjustments to these mini robot control cars as the students prepare for the battlefield at the annual holding of the Wacky Races. Oh, the strategy is terrible. It's just trying to hurt as many cars as possible. Uh, we're planning to jam everyone's uh, Wi Fi communications. On the way out, Wacko! On the way out. The event is based on the 1968 cartoon series Wacky Races. Computer and mechanical engineering students built these remote control vehicles to make it around the obstacle course. Um, it's on a mini Cooper chassis, so I mean, what better chassis to have for a tank that's got a spinning weapon on the front? The ten teams were battling through three different rounds, including making it around the track using infrared controllers, a speed test allowing the use of weapons, and the final death match, where the winner takes all. But the class's eye-catching tutor had to tone down the antics this year. He says the Department of No Fun and Games stepped in with stricter rules. I've had to sort of ban things this year, like flamethrowers and things which will um, squirt shaving foam over the carpet you see this time, which is a bit of a problem. The students designed, assembled and programmed these microchips, which are used in the vehicles and everyday items like mobile phones. Pretty much any appliance that you have in the house these days, which has got a, um, a microprocessor, and these are the guys who design this sort of stuff. Yeah. When it came to claiming the winning prize, it was this little red fire truck that stole the show. Whether it hurts them or not wasn't as big a deal. It's just if it, it, good laughs, a bit of entertainment, yeah, that's what we're going for. But while the remote control cars impressed the crowds of students watching. Yeah, it's pretty intense. There's a few good weapons of spinning objects and firing water cannons. Pretty cool. The lack of flamethrowers was disappointing. Yeah, I was, I was down to see a flamethrower, but 
or maybe some, yeah, I don't know, some glue on the floor, I don't know. Maybe next year the Department of No Fun and Games will be more relaxed about it. Emma Cropper, CTV News. That's CTV News Week in Review. I'm Grant Mangan. Have a great weekend. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.